Alan, you started this show, so it looks like you're going to end it. All right. All right. There we go. All right, so now we've gone from growing grass and growing soil and birthing and finishing and everything else all the way now to processing. So, this can either make you or break you, okay? Can make you or break you. You spend, let's take a, a, a grass finished steer, you know, you spent two years, and then if you count the nine months of gestation and all that, you spent about three years getting that calf ready, the harvest and all of that. So three years invested, take it to the processor, you have a hiccup there, and three years is down the drain. So one day, one bad day can completely ruin you. So this step is really, really important. And we've got a, the problem is most producers don't know very much about processing, right? And so you just sort of carry an animal into the plant, drop them off, and leave. And then you trust everything else is going to happen like it needs to happen. But you need to have involvement. You need to have involvement. That's the way you're going to get the type of attention and detail that you really, really need. So first and foremost, be very careful in selecting your processor. And I'll be very honest with you, I would rather haul them a lot further than I would like to find the right processor than to take them down the road an hour or so to the wrong one, okay? So, and, and I've done that in the past. I mean, I've put cattle on big trucks and shipped them eight hours to have them processed, to have them processed properly. So it, it does matter. So be careful in selecting your processor. Seek outside expertise when you don't have it. You know, establish a routine presence at your processor. Again, don't just show up, drop them off, and then show back up when they call you and tell you your meat's ready to pick up. It's good to be there occasionally at least when they slaughter and when they fabricate. And don't tell them you're coming, okay? You just show up. And that way you sort of keep them on their toes. They don't know if you're going to be there or not. So it, that does help, believe it or not, you know, and them doing, doing a better job for you. And that works, where, and, and I've worked with big plants, mid-sized plants, and small mom-and-pop plants. And that strategy works no matter the size of the plant. And works quite well. So show up. Show up. And be very clear in communicating what you want and need done. Don't leave ambiguity there. This means you need to have a very specific cut sheet. Okay? Don't just say, well, do it like you do it. Whatever. Don't, don't do that. You, know, you need to clearly understand what you want out of each species. What kind of cuts do you want out of lamb, goat, pigs, beeves, all of that? You know, the beef carcass is the toughest, right? Because the beef carcass can be fabricated into 50 plus different items. 50 plus. That's a lot. When you're taking a hole and now you're breaking it down into 20, 30, 40, 50 different SKUs, you know, parts and pieces that you're going to sell, and they're not the same proportion, and they're not the same value. So it introduces a lot of complexity into this whole system. Compared to beef, pork and lamb are easy in terms of breaking carcasses down. You have far fewer items or SKUs from them than you do a beef carcass. 
Now, another thing that we have found to be very, very helpful is invest with your, part, your processing partner when you can. And this could be pretty simple. It could be investing, do they need a new patty machine? Do they need a new grinder? Do they need a roll stock machine or whatever? You know, you'll find that if you help them some and invest a little bit, then they sort of owe you, okay? And I like to have my processor owing me rather than the other way around. And when you need slots and all of this, they'll work with you a whole lot better because you're, you've invested with them. So we've even invested with processors in terms of adding cold storage and things like that. So we'll do strategic investment partnerships with processors you know, to help in that regard and watch hidden cost. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So in terms of working with your process, you got to build a really good relationship there. This is just, again, this is so important. Understand their capacity, capability, and their needs. Not just yours, but theirs. What can they really do? And do they fit you? You know, don't, don't try to put a square peg in a round hole here with processing, you know, make sure that the processor is the right fit for you, your scope and scale and market, okay? Schedule way in advance, but then you better stick to that because if you schedule way in advance and then you start calling a week ahead or a day ahead and canceling, they're going to be pretty upset with you. And I don't blame them. That's their business. You just cost them throughput. And they were dependent on your, your animals being there the next day. Okay? So, and, they, and they've got to pay their staff every day and themselves every day and operate the plan every day. So it works both ways. So it's always, always best to have sort of a routine on your harvest slots. Right? I'm going to be here every week, every two weeks, every month whatever the case may be, but I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to be here. So that, that helps as well. Be very clear in your communication to them about what you want, what you expect, what your cut sheet specs are, what your packaging needs are. And, and we'll talk about pros and cons of some of this in a moment, but dry aging versus wet aging. Uh, you know, how you want things portioned, how you want things fabbed, further processing and fabrication, all of those types of things matter. And again, as I said before, establish a routine presence at the plant, uh, prompt payment and pickup of product. They have only a certain amount of cold storage at the plant. And if they call you and tell you, you it's ready, you need to be there pretty quick to pick it up the next day or so because they need to get your product cleared out of cold storage so they can get other product into cold storage. So if you're waiting and waiting, then you're actually impeding them and their business. The dry aging. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a moment, all right? So hold, hold that because I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about dry aging, wet aging, and, and what we really need to be doing and why. That's a very good question, and I will answer that. Uh, and again, be a repeat customer, okay? That's, that's quite important. Provide a steady stream of work for them, and like I said before, think about investing somehow with them. So what about our role as the producer? And we got a lot of expectations out of the processor, but, but what is our responsibility? So first of all, properly finish your livestock. I have actually seen a lot of people complain about their processor. Well, they ruined my product. Or I didn't get back what I sent, or whatever. And I hear that over and over, and they blame the processor for poor end product, and it wasn't the processor at all. It was the producer that failed to adequately and properly finish those animals that they took in, and then I guess they expected the processor to perform a miracle. 
processor was going to take standard cattle and turn them into upper two-thirds choice somehow. But uh, not going to happen, right? So here's another deal with processing. Adequate to high degree of finish prevents a lot of potential issues for you in the dry aging, in the wet aging, in the shrink, in the retail yield, in the quality of that end product, in the enjoyment of that end product by your customer base. Okay, So getting an adequate and proper degree of finish not only helps your processor, but it helps you enormously as well. So, so don't take, and I'll show you what we're talking about there, what a properly finished animal looks like in a little bit. On your end, on your end, handle, handle your livestock, cattle, sheep, pigs, whatever that you're taking in calmly and quietly at all times. If you get them all riled up at home, trying to get them gathered and loaded in the trailer and then to the processor, think about it. When they get to the processor and you dump them off, they're in a very strange place they've never been before, right? And now they're really not going to be calm because they don't know where they are. They don't know what to expect. It's all strange to them. So your handling them calmly and quietly, getting them to that point is going to help assure that they're calm while they're there in the holding pens at the processing plant. Now that's the other thing I look at too, is when I pull up and I unload, I'm evaluating that person back there and how they handle them cattle or them pigs or whatever. If there's a hot shot there, I'm not coming back there again, okay? And if they're hollering, yelling at the animals, anything like that, they better be calm and cool and collected because that's what's going to keep my livestock calm and cool and collected. So that's what I'm looking for in the individual back there at the holding pen. Uh, transportation to the plant, again, Make sure you've got de adequate trailer space. Everybody's got room. They're not crowded. They're not jostled, jostled, all of that. Make sure you've got good footing in the trailer so they're not slipping and sliding and falling and bruising themselves, even injuring themselves. Make sure that you or whoever's hauling them drives calmly, okay, and you're not throwing them up against the side of the trailer, turning curves and that kind of thing, uh, or making sudden stops, slamming on brakes. All of those types of things matter. So whoever hauls our livestock, we check them out carefully. And we have a very short list of people we allow to haul for us because of that. So it, we're, we're going to the same people over and over and over again hauling anything for us. And again, I said that earlier, provide clear and detailed cutting instructions and clear aging instructions. And I'm going to talk about, go through some things on the aging. All right, so properly finished cattle. Now, so we do, we do have our own um, on-farm USDA poultry processing, but not the red meat. Now, we're thinking about adding that, cause, but that's a whole nother ball game. But right, we've always done that through a processing partner. But we do have our own USDA on-farm poultry processing where we can do, you know, chickens, we can do turkeys, we can do ducks, geese, guinea fowl, all of those types of things. And that's a lot easier to add, okay, under USDA processing than the red meat. So if you are thinking about initially adding some on-farm processing, you want to start on the poultry side. Far, far easier, far lower capital, CapEx required and all of that to get into that. So uh, and if anybody's interested in that, I can give you a host of ways to sort of get started in that regard. But you know, years and years ago, before we started raising turkeys, so we raise a lot of turkeys now as well for the, the holiday season, Thanksgiving and Christmas season, all of that. 
And turkeys are an excellent, excellent income generator. We average about $100 per turkey. Okay. Do what? Well, that's our retail price, but, but about $100 per turkey. Uh, essentially, right around 5 to $6 a pound, okay, dressed on the turkeys. But uh, so between 80 to $110 per turkey on the average. Uh, so so they, are, they are a good income generator, and we always sell out. Uh, they're, they're in very high demand. But many, many years ago, before we started raising turkeys, uh, my, and this is a mother-in-law, a true mother-in-law story, okay? So my, uh, my in-laws live in Houston, Texas, and, and my wife has a lot of siblings, and so we used to meet up at my in-laws every Thanksgiving. And because there were a lot of siblings, my, my mother-in-law liked to cook the biggest turkey she could find, okay? So she would go, but she was also very cheap, all right? So she wanted to buy the cheapest turkey she could buy. So she would go to the frozen turkey bin in the grocery store, you know, and just a few days before Thanksgiving, you know, in the frozen turkey bin, they sort of lower the price a little bit. So she would go over to the frozen turkey bin, and, but she never trusted the weight printed on the package, okay? So she would have to lift every turkey to feel the weight. She called it hefting the turkey. So she would go to the frozen turkey bin and pick them up and feel them and set them aside. And, and so this particular Thanksgiving, she was doing that, and she reached into the bin and she picked up one and felt it and set it aside, and she kept going on and on through the bin. And finally, she noticed there was a stock boy standing over there staring at her this whole time. I'm sure he had to be thinking, what is this crazy lady doing? And, and she looked over him and she said, son, do these turkeys get any bigger? And he looked at her and he said, no, ma'am, they're dead. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So, uh, <laughs> in cattle, how do we know when we got them properly finished? So, there is a difference between the sexes, okay? Between steers and heifer mates. Now, I'll tell you, if I could, I would always finish all heifers. Always. Far prefer them, right? At the same end point, They'll be fatter, they'll have more marbling, and they'll be more tender, okay? So I would far prefer to finish all heifers, but by golly, we've got to have some to breed. So we finish steers as well to meet all of our demand. But uh, so again, the heifers will also typically tend to finish 80 to 100 pounds lighter at the same end point as their steer mates. Our average steer is going to weigh around 1,200 or so pounds, grading USDA choice and up, okay? So that's about the end point for most of our steers. So our, that means our heifers are going to weigh 11 to 1120, grading choice and up when they're finished. But again, those heifers will stack on a little more marbling at the same end point, and they'll be a little more tender. But here's the key things we got to think about. We got to think about marbling, also called intramuscular fat. We got to think about back fat and kidney, pelvic, and heart fat, or that internal fat. We got to think about dressing percent in the age at harvest. How many of you harvest beef animals in here? Okay, you all familiar with the 30 month rule? Okay, that's one of those government things that once the government passes something, they never go back and correct it, right? So in 2003, December 2003, we had a mad cow incident in the U.S. And the government decided, and this has never been proven, this is one of those knee-jerk reactions, that, okay, if they're 30 months of age or older, we've got to take out all bone, particularly the spine and all of that, right? And, and so if it's 30 months or older, it's supposed to be boneless. You can't do a bone-in carcass. Uh, and... So that's the 30-month rule. So what does a finished animal look like? How do we know when they're finished? Well, first, here's the things that we look at. 
Now we do a lot of ultrasound, but that's to select them earlier on and then to project out when they're going to be finished. But we don't ultrasound them before we pull them and harvest them. We just go by visual appraisal, so to speak. So we look along the top line on a well-finished animal. They're going to be nice and smooth over the, over the top or even have an indent right in the middle. Okay, so a butterfly top or nice and smooth over top. A well-finished animal is never going, that, those spinous processes or that ridge running right down the center of the spine is never going to be sharp or visible at all on a well-finished animal. So if you see that sharpness, they're not finished yet. So they're going to have this nice smooth turn over the top. You're not going to be able to visibly see any ribs on a well-finished animal. They're going to have a nice spongy fat cover all the way back through that 13th rib. So ribs are not going to be visible. Then I'm going to look down in the flank and the heart girth. And in a well-finished animal, I call it a soggy appearance. They're going to be soggy or deep in the heart girth and deep in that flank. So those are other indicators. And then for final degree of finish... And knowing that they're ready to go to harvest, there's two final places I look. And that's the brisket and the tailhead. These are the last two places that they're going to deposit a lot of fat prior to being ready to harvest. And that brisket should be really extended, okay, deep, and it should have a clear floor to it, not coming down to a point. If the brisket is high and tight and pointed, then they're not ready. Okay? They got a lot more to put on, a lot more weight to put on, a lot more fat to put on. So I actually want to see that brisket almost exaggerated. And, and what I tell people is it needs to look like somebody stuck a football down in that brisket. Okay? And it needs to have some width to the floor of the brisket. That's when you know you got a really, really well finished animal. And then on the tailhead, we're looking for poning. Y'all know what I'm talking P-O-N-I-N-G, poning around the tailhead. I'll show you that in the next picture or two. So here's a brisket on this heifer, is, and she's two years old, but you can tell she's ready to harvest. Okay, again, deep distended body, deep heart girth, deep flank, smooth turn over the top. Look how full this brisket is. That's what we're looking for. A really, really full brisket there. And then the, these are cattle in a feedlot, but you can easily see the pones. So you see the poning around the tailhead here on a lot of these. That's what we're looking for. It's almost like somebody stuck an air pump up underneath the hide and, and pumped it up. Okay? But pones around the tailhead. So when you see a deep distended brisket and poning around the tailhead, that's, they've pretty much done all they can do. And they're ready to go. You're, you're really not going to add much more after you start seeing that. So what are your expectations? How much sellable meat will each animal yield? Now, I've had people that have sat in on seminars and workshops and all of that and been told that they should get 75 80% yield out of a beef carcass. They're lying to you, okay? Ain't going to happen. So when you hear that, and I've even seen it in advertisements, breed association advertisements, okay? It's not true, folks. It's not going to happen. So you're being fed unrealistic expectations there. So be reasonable about your expectations on how much sellable product you're going to get out of each animal. Educate yourself on quality grade, yield grade, shrink, and other factors that determine end product yield and quality. You need to be aware of those. Be fully aware of seasonality issues. Okay? Now, what do I mean by that? If you're a seasonal finisher, what does that mean? But what about the processing itself? Oops. Do what? 
Okay, there you go. A processor is a year-round business, okay? And if you're, if you're trying to get everything finished and harvested in October, and that's it, only in October, then you're trying to flood your... Pro in other words, you're trying to tell your processor, I want you to let me be your only October customer. Forget everybody else. You got to let me in in October. That usually don't work very well, okay? You're, you're creating unrealistic expectations of your processor in that regard. So we got to be aware of things like that. And you got to be aware of how much you expect to pay for slaughter and fabrication, for portioning, grinding, patties, further processing, smoking, making hot dogs, jerky, beef sticks, all of that. All of that matters. Yep. How do we what? How do you call? How do you tell which animals are going to give you a higher percent? Well, you got two choices on that. You either got to kill enough animals and have the data back on them to know which ones perform and which ones don't, and then you got to know the parentage on them, right? So you can start working on the breeding in, or you got to work with people that already have been doing that and know the genetics. That's the easiest way. Uh, so, and, and we do, we know, we know most of the genetics out there in this regard because we've been killing for 30 years and collecting carcass data on, you know, hundreds of thousands of head. So we pretty much know who's going to work, who doesn't, and, and what you need to be looking for in that regard. If you uh, do hot dogs and... Mm -hmm. Okay, so absolutely, and, and, and I'll get into that a little more in a moment, but we want to be able to use as much of that carcass and the drop as we possibly can. And so when you're doing further process items like the sausages, the hot dogs, beef sticks, things like that, then I can put a lot more of the 50-50 trim and the navels and all of that in there. So I can make use of the fat that otherwise is gonna be thrown away. And I'm not gonna make a penny off of it. I wanna make a dollar off absolutely every bit of that animal that I possibly can. So yes, like sausages, hot dogs, beef sticks, we'll make them like a 65-35, 35% fat. And they're far better that way. Don't make lean stuff. Your customers won't like it. And never make a 90 hamburger, a 90% lean hamburger. I don't care what a person says, nobody likes eating 90% hamburger. It's not good, okay? We, we never make anything under an 80, you know, so leaner than an 80. Our hamburger is 80s, 80s, 20s. So, uh, and our customers absolutely love it. And nobody ever complains about it. And by the way, guys, what do you think a lot of the phytonutrients and fatty acids are? In the fat. Okay, we don't need lean meat. Lean meat is not healthy. That, that is just simply not true, folks. Okay, lean meat is not healthy meat. It is not healthy for us. We need good fats. Do what? Want lean, eat goat. There you go. And always address any concerns with your processor quickly and honestly. So you got to know what your target is. What is your target for in product quality? And again, I'm using beef as an example, but you got to know this for your lambs. You got to know this for your goats. You got to know it for your pigs. All of that. Even your chickens. What is your in product quality target? And because of that, again, you've got to be in the plants. So we're in the plants all the time. And of course, now we do a lot of consulting and processing plants as well. So we're very used to working with plants and processing. But, but you've got to get in there and you've got to see your carcasses often enough to know what's really going on. So, you know, these are some of our carcasses. Uh, again, you know, this is a USDA choice animal here. And they're always graded at the 12th rib ribeye. So again, this is, we're looking for this and better. Okay, that, that's, 
uh, mid-choice right there. And this is what we're after. So that's our beef. That, that's what we're trying to hit over and over and over again. And that's grass finished, grass-fed? Yes. And what's the, South Pole? South Pole, mm-hmm. 24, 24 to 26, but we calve. So we'll have some animals. We're harvesting anywhere from about 22 to 28. But the reason for that is we have a defined breeding and calving season. So we're not calving year-round, and we're not calving two different seasons of the year. So some animals are going to be older when they're harvested just by we've got to have animals in the pipeline every week, every month. So some of them are going to be older, some of them are going to be a little younger because of that. Now, the beautiful thing about grass finishing, unlike feedlot finishing, when, when they're finished in the feedlot, they go on the show list and they better be gone quick or they'll die. They cannot l survive on that TMR finishing ration. It will kill them, either from fatty liver disease or acidosis or whatever, but it will kill them. So they can't stay alive forever in a feedlot. No feedlot has animals that have been on feed on the finishing ration for two years, three years, four years, or whatever, guys. That don't happen, okay? They'll die on that hot finishing ration. Now, if you're farm finishing, I'm not talking doing some grain feeding. I'm not talking about that. That's a whole different ball game. But if you haven't experienced feedlots and you don't know how hot those finishing rations are, they are hot, real hot. And they cannot live forever on that, okay? But the beautiful thing about grass finishing is, okay, they're fat, they're ready to go at 23 months, but I need some older animals in my pipeline to meet my needs so I can keep, they can keep eating grass and keep eating grass and keep eating grass, and they're going to stay perfectly healthy. They'll just get fatter, but they'll stay healthy. So there's never an issue there. But this is what we're targeting on our grass finished beef. And we hit this with a very, very high degree of, of consistency and uniformity. Pastured pork, the same way. We want a high degree of marbling in our pastured pork. We do not want lean pork. And Ryan said it the other day. I mean, you know, pork is not the other white meat. Okay? I don't know why in the world the National Pork Producers Council thought that was a good thing. To advertise pork is the other white meat and put it up against chicken, but I don't want white pork. I don't want pale pork. I want pork that looks like beef. And I want pork that looks like beef also in terms of the fact that it has a whole lot of marbling to it. And that's what our customers want. We actually want our customers to confuse a ribeye steak with a bone-in pork chop and not know the difference. So... We typically take our pigs up to about 320, 330. That's where we like to harvest them. A number of reasons for that. Number one, we get more size to those chops and other primals. Number two, they're going to have more marbling. And number three, they're going to have more flavor. Maturity does impart a lot more flavor, guys. So, you know, just a little bit more age to them, and you're going to have a lot more flavor. And customers really like that. So common issues. Not addressing concerns or problems in a reasonable or courteous manner. We need to make sure we don't make that mistake with our processor. Number two, understand and respect the processor's point of view. These are a lot of the things the processors are often blamed for. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes they're not at fault. Sometimes they are. But a lot of times these are unwarranted. Well, my animals weighed more than that. Well, did they really? Did they really? You know, a lot of times you're the one that's wrong on the weight, not the processor. Number two, I didn't get my meat back. I got somebody else's meat, or I didn't get all my meat back. There's no way I only got 250 pounds out of that carcass. Well, maybe there is. Maybe it wasn't what you thought it was, okay? My meat was far better than what I got back. What did they do to it? They didn't cut it like I asked. I wanted tenderloins and T-bones. 
Now, I can tell a lot of you don't know much about processing if you didn't catch that one. Tell me about that one. You can't have both out of the same animal. Okay? Where in the world did the tenderloins come from? From where the T-bones come from and the porterhouses come from. And so if I cut fillets or tenderloins, that means I can't have out of that same animal a porterhouse or a T-bone. It's one or the other. Okay? But, but you wouldn't believe how many producers, well, where in the heck are my fillets and my T-bones? You know? And that's not the processor's fault. They can't, they can't magically do both. So I wanted my carcass aged 21 days or 30 days. Why did I get back far less pounds than I should have? Because you wanted it aged 30 days, and it's got a tremendous shrink loss. Okay? You didn't account for the shrink loss that you got with that degree of aging. I heard a steer should yield... So I brought this up earlier, didn't I? I heard a steer should yield 72% cutout from the hanging weight. Why do I have less than that? Nope, nope, nope. You got to understand what is reasonable here. Yes. So I've heard about wet Yep. I'm getting to that. Getting to it. Sometimes, Tim, it just requires patience. <laughs> All right, so what happened to my organs, bones, and hide? What did you ask for them? Did you ask for them? Okay. All right. So, again, other common issues, being able to schedule slaughter and fabrication slots when needed. And, boy, during COVID, that got to be a major, major problem, didn't it? Now, since COVID, there, have been, there has been a build-out of more plants, and existing plants have added further capacity. So this has eased up some from where it used to be, at least in certain areas of the country. There can be cutting, packing, labeling, and cold storage errors. Your order was not ready when you thought it would be. Poor carcass yields, poor marbling or back fat. Now, these are not the processor's fault. They can't magically add yield or marbling. If it wasn't there when that live animal came in, it's not going to be there on the other end on the fabrication floor. So that, that's not their fault. What types of processing exist out there? And you've got to understand this and know what you need to satisfy your customer base. So the, you know, sort of the top here is USDA inspected. Okay, USDA inspected. Why would you need USDA inspected? If you're going retail, legally. Well, not necessarily. Yes and no. Okay, interstate sales. Selling across state lines. Selling across state lines, okay? Interstate commerce. So if I'm selling in multiple states or across state lines, or I'm, my customers are ordering and I'm shipping it across state lines, you know, via UPS, FedEx, or whatever, it's got to be USDA inspected or I am out of reg. I'm, I'm working against the law, okay? Um, if I'm going to sell to restaurants and grocery stores, they almost always are going to want it USDA inspected, even if it's within the same state. Most of the time they require that. Some don't, but most of them do. Then the next tier down is we have state inspected plants. So if I'm selling within state borders, then I can sell to anybody I want to legally within state with a state expected inspected plant. I just can't sell out of state. Okay? Then we have custom exempt plants. Now how can you use a custom exempt plant? These are neither state inspected nor federally inspected. How can you use that? Okay, right. You're technically selling a customer a live animal, and they're paying for the processing and all of that. Okay? So that's how you can get away with doing custom exempt. Now, oftentimes, that's lower cost for processing, right? But the other a drawback, though, is custom exempt plants often have 
far less capability. And I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Oh. Sorry. Won't do that again. Okay, now he's got to build me for a cable. All right, so uh, again, custom exempt. This is um, you know something that you can use, but you can only technically sell the live animals. There are some mobile processing units. There's not a bunch of them around. The concept has been around for quite a while, but it's extremely hard to make that profitable, especially on doing beeves and th large animals very hard to make it profitable. Uh, so that's why you don't see a whole lot of this around right now. And most of the mobile processing units are slaughter only. So that carcass still has to go to some kind of brick and mortar plant for further processing, okay? And then we've got on farm slaughter, which is exempt from inspection. So what's the deal with that? Okay, you can't, other than chickens, you can't sell to anybody, okay? So, for instance, like when we do events on the farm, we'll often do a whole pig cooking like they did out here today, or we'll do a uh, cook a whole lamb on the spit, uh, and we'll slaughter them right on the farm ourselves. But we're not charging for the meal, Okay. And, and you can serve anybody that legally without any problem if you're not charging for the meal. So you got to know these things. It's important to know these things. Uh, and in every state, and it's going to vary from state to state, you're allowed a certain number of broilers that you can harvest on farm non-inspected and then sell to the public. But you can't, it, in most states, you can't sell them at a farmer's market and you can't sell them to restaurants or grocery stores. You just got to sell them direct to the customer, but not at a farmer's market, okay? So it, it very, and some states allow you up to a thousand a year. Some states allow you up to a 10,000 a year doing that. Some states up to 20,000 a year. And a lot of the states that will only allow you a thousand a year are the ones that have the biggest presence of the vertical integrated poultry growers. Okay? They keep that number low because they don't want the competition. Then you got to know about USDA FSIS label claim. So if you're going to make any claims whatsoever, any, beyond it having the label of this is a ribeye, this is hamburger, this is a New York strip or something like that, you've got to go through the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service, the FSIS, to get any claim approved. So if you want to make, if you want on your retail label that it's 100% grass fed, you got to go through these guys to get that approved. If you want on your label claim that it's no antibiotic, no hormone, you got to get that approved. If you want it to say free range, pasture raised, regeneratively raised, whatever, you got to go through these guys. Yes, sir. See it on your website, not see it on your label. You got to be pretty careful about that, okay? A lot of times you can put stuff on your website, but if somebody calls you out on it and reports you, and you don't have it, you don't have it substantiated through the USDA FSIS, they could, you know, conceivably fine you for that. All right? So you, you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of things like that. 
Uh, but so you got to, you know, all of these things are things you've got to have FSI's approval to put these on the retail label. Now, the good news is, like on the regeneratively raised, as I said the other day, with regenified, if you're regenified verified, that is fully recognized by FSIS and USDA AMS. And if you're verified through that, they expedite you right through for that regenerative raised claim. You're not going to have any issue. And that's already been tested and proved. Okay? We've already had branded programs that have done that. And, and they, they sent them right through. But be aware, when you're trying to get a label claim, it could take you six months to a year to get through this process, unless you hire, hire a third-party expediter to walk it through the USDA FSIS for you. But if you're just sending it in on your own without an expediter, it can languish on some USDA person's desk for a long time. Okay, now, I'll have to tell you about some of these folks that are in these offices and what their knowledge level is, okay? So I've done hundreds and hundreds of these, well, maybe thousands of them. I've done them for 30 years, but a whole bunch of them. I've been through this process many times. So there was, there was a point in time, this was a few years back, but we had had and this was on beef, so we had had all of our labels always approved, no problem, and then we were, we were coming out with a 100% grass-fed beef hot dog. So if, as long as it's a raw product, nothing else added, you don't have to get additional approval. But the moment you add any other ingredients, you gotta go back through this label approval process. So because we were doing hot dogs, you got some added ingredients and further process, and we had to go back through this label approval process, okay? So we sent in the exact same protocols. So what you do to get this, you send it a set of written protocols that states how you raised them, what you fed them, what you did, all of that, okay? Then you got to send in your affidavit, a copy of your affidavit that, you know, shows that you stayed on there that, you know, these were not given antibiotics, hormones, fed grain, whatever. So we sent all that back in again for the approval of the hot dogs, thought this would just go right through, no problem, because we'd had approval after approval prior to that. Well, we get it rejected. And I'm like, what in the world? So we called them up and we said, okay, what's the problem? Why was this rejected? And, and they said, were you talking about your hot dogs here? And we said, yeah. Why was this rejected? It, we're not doing anything different. It's the same protocols. And they said, well, you clearly state in your protocol that these calves will be on their mother's milk until weaned. Yeah, we do. Okay, so what's the problem? And they said, well, but you got another statement here that says these animals have never been fed any byproduct. Yeah. They said, well, mother's milk is a byproduct. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, sir. These are our USDA personnel, okay, that we pay for with our taxpayer dollars, all right? Mother's milk is a byproduct. Did y'all know that? And, and, and I said, really? <laughs> yes. And I said, but it's not. And they said, well, you got to have peer-reviewed publications that you send to us proving that mother's milk is not a byproduct. So you want headaches? This is a whole lot of fun, folks. This is a whole, make sure you got everything, every T crossed and every I dotted because they will catch you on stuff that they don't understand. Okay? They don't understand. So... Again, if any of y'all need to do this and, and you're not quite sure about it, just give me a call or email me. I can walk you through the process and I can help you find some really good ex Always, always use an expediter. See, that's this other thing. This has created a cottage industry, okay, a whole cottage industry, but always use an expediter. All right. Oops. Battery go out on this?
Well, maybe I did. Nope. Yes, sir. I'm just, I'm just messing up. No, didn't drop it. I should have checked. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right. I don't know. Must be. All right. So every claim, every claim is a separate claim. So you see all all this stuff down here. It's all a separate claim. Okay. That it's not like you can lump them all together and get all of them approved just all together. You. Th th this is a process. Okay, so they can't be lumped together. For instance, 100% grass-fed can only refer to animals fed forages or approved non-grain supplements, okay? But the 100% grass-fed label does not cover whether or not they were given antibiotics, whether or not they're free range. In other words, they could have been 100% grass-fed in a feedlot, okay, and still receive the USDA FSIS 100% grass-fed label. They just can't receive the free-range label, okay? And if it's less than 100% grass-fed and you want a grass-fed claim, the label must read 85% grass, 15% grain, or something like that. Yeah, this gets really complicated, okay? New products, further fabricated products, again, require new submission for an yet another FSIS label approval. So whenever you're going through this, go ahead at the beginning and envision pretty much everything you think you'll ever need a label for and get it done. No matter whether you're going to wait three or four or five years before you actually manufacture it, just get it done. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Nope, no, nope. once it's done, it's done. Uh, again, use an expediter, uh, you know, and you gotta have, I mentioned the written protocols and affidavits that justify every claim you wanna make. If you've never done that before and you need a set of written protocols and an affidavit, I can send you some. Well, I've written many, many, many of those. So be happy to send you templates on that. All right, packaging. Packaging. You want really, really good packaging that appeals to the consumer. Okay? So I'm going to show you good and bad. Uh, and so, you know, some of White Oaks product, one pound hamburger brick. Uh, even the color, so the background color, the color of your labels, everything matters for the appeal of the product. For beef, I prefer black and green, black and green colors for beef labels and background. Okay, a black background on that chair red color of beef really works well. Like on a roll stock machine, I really like to have a black background there on the roll stock because it makes that chair red color pop against the black background. Uh, and then, you know, either a black label or a green label here for the retail label. And now you see, you see what Will's claiming here at the White Oak Radically Traditional Farming. He had to get FSIS label approval to have that on there. And all these other claims, raised without antibiotics, no added hormones, free roaming, pastured, humane, regenerative, he had to get approval for every one of those to have that on the retail label through the FSIS. So again, pork, uh, again, nice, neat packaging. You see the black background here. That's a roll stock machine packaged product with a black label on it. These are sugar-free beef franks uncured. You know, and again, I'm just showing you different examples of packaging. Every, every retail label should always have this, we call it a bug, the plant bug. So that says it's USDA inspected and passed, and it gives you the establishment number for the plant that did the work. Okay, so every, every retail label is supposed to have that bug on it by law. 
So let's talk about typical live weight to dress weight yields, okay? So what's removed on the kill floor? What's taken off on the kill floor? Well, head, hide, ophal, blood, and serum, and, and some of the bones, okay? Not all of them, but some of the bones, okay? And then we have a dressing percent, okay? Dressing percent, that's the hot carcass weight divided by the live weight times 100. That's a dressing percent. Here are common dressing percentages, okay, for grass-fed and pasture-raised livestock. So for a lot of grass-fed beef cattle, it, it averages 55 to 60 percent. Now, we're averaging about 61 to 62 percent, but that's because we put in a high degree of finish, a high degree of finish. But there's too many grass-fed cattle that are averaging 55 percent or even a little lower. If they have a lot of dairy influence, they are going to dress lower. They're not going to dress out what a full 100% beef animal is. Okay? So you got to expect that. Pasture raised hogs, 68 to 72. Pasture raised lambs, 45 to 52 on average. So that's what we're looking at. And there can be a very wide range of dressing percentages and retail yield based on breed type, phenotype, degree of finish shrink, how much bone in or bone less you do, how much fat you leave on the end product versus trimming off, all of that's going to influence your retail sellable weight. So what do you want to be thinking about relative to retail sellable weight? What do you want to be thinking about? Well, first, you need to be thinking about how do I maximize total sellable pounds of product, right? Okay, so what are two things I can do there that are going to help me in that regard? Well, but I'm talking about at the processing. Okay, as much bone in cuts as possible because bone adds weight, sellable weight. And oh, by the way, a bone-in product actually cooks better, it's juicier, and, ha and it's more flavorful than a bone-less. I'll take a bone-in ribeye, bone-in pork chop, bone-in roast any day over a bone-less. It's always going to eat better, always. And it's going to cook better, always, than a bone-less. And then Keith installed your soup bones and your dog bones. There you go. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah, yep, we're going to talk about that. And... and Instead of trimming real thin on the fat, we leave more fat on it. That's sellable weight, but that's also flavor. Exactly. They cook better with more fat on it, more flavor, more juiciness, and the fat is healthy for you. You know? And my wife still. My, my mother-in-law was raised to think that two things about meat. It's got to be super lean and no fat. So she taught my wife to trim every ounce of fat off of any piece of beef. I will not allow my wife to throw the fat away. So you put that on my plate. Okay? We are not wasting that good fat. And I have to tell you this one other story, and you know the mother-in-law story. So before my wife and I got married, my mother-in-law called me the beef guy. I was that beef guy, okay? And so we went to visit my future in-laws there, and my future mother-in-law wanted to impress me and cook a beef roast, all right? And so she cooked it all right. I mean, she made sure there was no life left in that roast. It was cooked till it was truthfully bone dry. And you know how you can just look at one and tell that, right? And that fell apart, and she called that tender. Look at how tender this is. You know, it's just falling apart. And I knew what I was in for in that eating experience. And we sat down in their dining room, and she cut me a couple of slices with anticipation and put it on my plate, and she watched me, you know, to eat that. And so... Again, I knew what was getting ready to happen. 
I was actually looking around, did she make a gravy? Is there anything to add moisture to this roast? And there was nothing, nothing. So I ate it, chewed it, somehow swallowed it, and she was like, like this, oh, oh yeah, it's good, it's good. I mean, what am I gonna tell her, right? Yeah, it's good, it's good. And then by golly, after I finished those two pieces, she cut me seconds. Man, so I had to eat it twice, twice. But uh, so know what your anticipated dressing percent is, okay? Know what that is. Hogs, you're going to have a difference in yield, skin on, skin off. Now, I far prefer, I don't want to skin a hog. I want to scald and scrape a hog because I want, I want the skin on, okay? Uh, you can leave heads on hogs or take them off. You can't do that with beef animal, okay? But on hogs, you can leave head on or you can take it off. And then what we're doing with everything else can influence retail yield. So let's just do a quick calculation here, all right? So live weight, uh, 1,250 pounds, hot carcass weight, 729. So the dressing percent, we run it through this formula, ended up at 60%. If we look at a lamb, that lamb came in at a live weight of 105, hot carcass weight of 54, so it yielded 51.4%. So it's pretty easy to calculate these and to know what you got. All right, now, Tim, here we go. Okay. Dry aging versus wet aging. Okay. Dry aging. Dry aging is a process of hanging the carcass for an extended period of time to concentrate. It, you do it for two reasons. You do it to concentrate the flavor because you're shrinking moisture out. You're losing moisture, so that concentrates the flavor, right? Flavor's not as diluted by moisture. And you do it to enhance tenderness. Those are the two primary reasons. <laughs> it's both a science and an art. And unfortunately, most processors today don't know the art part of this. So they don't do this well. Okay? You can dry age an entire carcass or individual primals and subprimals. It's de and it's heavily dependent. Proper dry aging is dependent on three primary things. Temperature, humidity, and air circulation. You get any of those wrong or all of those wrong and you got a problem and you don't have a good product in the end, okay? So the temperature should be between 32 and 36 and never exceed 36. Humidity needs to be around 85%, and you need good airflow at all times. So the fans in that cooler have to be working well, and you don't want sides to touch, okay? Anywhere sides touch, they're going to form a bacterial plaque on both sides that are touching. And that's trim loss. That's got to be, that's a bacterial plaque, and all of that has to be trimmed off and thrown away. You just lost that yield. Plus, the longer you age, the more they shrink, you've lost sellable weight. And then, the longer you age, they form that bark. It's called the bark on the outside, right? That hair coat, which is a fungal coat. That's part of the aging process. Aging is nothing but a controlled rot, okay? That's the truth about what dry aging is. It's a controlled rot. Yes, sir. Between dry aging and wet aging, what percentage do you have extra in the dry aging? Okay, you have far more trim loss and shrink loss with dry aging. You have very, very little of both of those with wet aging. 10%, in terms of... Loss, oh, additional loss, it depends on... So on dry aging... Boy, that really depends. It depends on how long you're dry aging, how well they're adhering to temperature, humidity, and air circulation. Depends on their ability to trim, okay, and all of that. And it depends on the amount of finish, the amount of back fat you put on that animal. The less back fat, the more shrink loss you're going to have. So it could be 10%, it could be 20%, it could be 30% that you're losing on retail sellable weight, okay? So the pros of this are 
Highly concentrates flavor, excellent for increasing tenderness and appealing texture. The cons are shrink loss, trim loss, musty flavor in the ground beef, and many processors don't have enough room to dry age carcasses for extended periods of time. And then you've got to be careful of rancidity as well. Okay? So this is an example of dry aging. And you can see, you know, in some dry aged product that you could have a lot of trim here, right? Now, here's what we do. Here's what we do. We never dry age a whole carcass. Why do I want to? I don't want to take the shrink loss and the trim loss. We fabricate everything at about 72 hours after a kill, okay? Then we immediately process the trim into hamburger. It's fresh, has a much longer shelf life, and you're not risking a musty flavor in it from improper trim, okay? Then if we have a customer that wants dry aging, we just dry age a subprimal, the whole ribeye or whatever for them, okay? And we charge them a lot more for it because I got shrink and trim loss then, okay? But mostly we wet age. So wet aging is fabricating within 48 to 72 hours after slaughter. You seal the primals or the subprimals in a cryovac and go back and store it at 32 to 34 degrees. And then once we get a good wet age on it, that's when you can break it back out and portion it in individual package, okay? The pros are you get virtually no shrink loss. You do get further tenderization because it's an aging process. There's very little chance for rancidity or musty flavors, and you're not having to worry about the humidity, airflow, and all of that, okay? And you get a longer, fresh shelf life on that product. We've gotten fresh shelf life of over 100 days routinely on our really nice wet age products. Our customers love that. Our retail grocery store customers love that because shelf life is everything to them, right? Cons are you don't get any further concentration of flavor like you do the dry aging, but you know what? We got plenty of flavor anyway because it's grass fed off a highly diverse diet. And, uh, but other than that, you know, the, the pros are all to the wet aging. So this is wet aging here, okay? All right, we do have a grass finishing calculator and all of that, you know, so anybody that is interested in that, we can provide that. It allows you to run all kinds of scenarios and pop out what's really going to happen with different scenarios. Beef carcass breakdown, typically... You get 69% in lean cuts, 12 to 14% trimmable fat, 15 to 17% bone. And then out of your loins, you know, the middle meats, you've, they only amount to 9 to 12% of the total carcass weight. But they make up 21 to 24% of the total wholesale value. So the average retail yield from live weight to actual retail cuts is 41 to 44%. Okay, so to make the math easy, if we started with a 1,000 pound live weight animal, then that means we would get a little over 400 pounds retail yield. No, that would be boneless, boneless, yep. All right, other sellable items now, okay? Bones, all the bones, and I'm gonna show you how we use these in a minute, show you pictures of that. Marrow bones, ribs, oxtail, vertebrae, joints, everything has a use and can be sold. So we take advantage of that. These bones have a lot of value. Most people never do anything with their bones. My goodness, I can turn the bones of an individual carcass into, uh, you know, easily another three to four hundred dollars a carcass. Okay, just from the bones alone. Fat. We got 90% trim, we got 85s, we got 65s, and we got 50s, and we got navels. So the key is, how can I use more of the 65s, the 50s, and the navels? Okay, what kind of items can I fabricate that are higher fat? So instead of throwing that away, I can use that and sell that. Tallow, we sell tallow. Render it down. Anything you fry, french fries, anything else, tastes far, far better 
fried and grass-fed beef tallow than they do fried and vegetable oil. And they're actually far healthier for you as well. So, and I'll show you another use for tallow in a moment. Cheek meat. How many have eaten cheek meat off of beef? It is outstanding, isn't it? Outstanding. Okay? I love cheek meat. And this, we can sell all the cheek meat we can produce. Tongue, organ meats, heart kidney, liver, thymus, pancreas, all of that, hides, the fluids, plasma, and serums, tendons, and ligaments. There's a market for every bit of this. Okay, a market for every bit of it. All right, we've got a lot of restaurants doing this now. This is a beef tallow candle appetizer. Okay, so what our restaurants are doing is they take the rendered beef tallow, they infuse it with whatever seasoning and herbs and all of that that they want, and you pour it into whatever shape dish they want, stick a cotton wick in the center, put it in the fridge, harden it up, and then in the evenings they bring, bring them out in shifts, light them, have them ready, and they sell them as a table candle appetizer. $15 or more a piece. Okay? And people... You can see sopping it up, right, with bread. People will buy these things and ask for more bread to sop up every drop of that. It is that good. So table, candle, tallow, appetizers. Is that tomato that they mix in with this? No, that's just the, uh, oh, right in there? I don't know. That's a good question. That's it. I think that picture I took at Ovenbird Restaurant in Birmingham. Not sure. Marabone appetizers, again, $15 plus per appetizer. Canoe them, which means we just split them in half, cut them about six inches in length. You, you sprinkle whatever herbs or whatever you want on top of it, put it in the oven, roast it. Incredibly healthy for you, incredibly healthy. Then we take oxtail meat a lot of times with these marabone appetizers, and we sprinkle the oxtail meat over top of it like crab meat, okay? These sell incredibly well, and they are delicious. They're absolutely delicious. And then organ meats. So we sell almost all of our organ meats two ways. For human consumption, we do an ancestral burger. We would put up to 30% organ meat in our burgers, and those sell at $18 a pound all day long for an ancestral hamburger, okay, that contains kidney, heart, liver, all right? $18 a pound, people never blink an eye. Pet food as well, so we do pet food, and so we use from our chickens, our pigs, our lambs, bees, whatever, organ meats and all of that, ground going into the pet food, makes fabulous, very healthy pet food. Yep, so, uh, Again, ideas with organ meats. So what we do with the pet food is we, we grind everything, blend. We also use high fat in that, so it's another way to use the 50s and the navels. We put them into 10-pound uh, chubs. Then we freeze it. Then we pull it back out once it's frozen, take it to the bandsaw, cut it into disc, and then put those into 5- to 10-pound bags for our customers. And so it's super easy for them. They've got them all sawed in a disc. All they got to do to feed their dog or whatever every day, pull a disc or two out from the freezer, throw it in their dish, boom, you're done. They're fed. Here's another. We do some of this. Boy, you talk about attracting people and all of that. You know, so these are steamship rounds. Okay, steamship rounds and just turned and turned so you see the two guys on the little stationary cycle deals here, right? And just keeping it turning over the spit, keeping it turning, right? Boy, is this delicious. And people, they'll just stand out there and stare out at their mouth watering until it's done. And then you can see our chickens over here, right? Okay, so the chickens again turning around on the spits here over the fire. So we've got steamship, beef steamship rounds, and whole chickens there to do a meal. 
Again, you know, that's a whole lamb there. So just to finish up, this is pretty good packaging here. Things that we're looking for to be attractive. Uh, again, ideas about really good packaging. Like I said, black color, green color works real well for red color meats. So again, ideas with some pretty good packaging, then I'll show you some less than desirable packaging. So this is less than desirable, okay? These are the things we don't want to happen, and these are the things we have to clean up. This is actually some of our product from years ago. We had to clean up with our processor, okay? So again, we don't want it packaged like this, all right? So these are things we have to go back to the processor on and say, nope. We don't, we don't need to do it this way, guys. How did that happen? Tell me how that happens. Sloppiness. Sloppiness. Throwing product around and all of that. Okay? All right. So, again, good packaging work. So, questions? We provide the labels to our processor. We provide the labels. Question. Yeah, uh, on if you're dry aging a whole carcass, I know air movement's important, but what about avoiding direct air from the fans blowing on the carcass? Is that a concern? Yes, it is. You don't want the air. Those fans need to be up above, up top here, and circulating the air from here, okay? Not down here, not at carcass level. So we don't, want, we don't want air circulating at the carcass level. We want air circulating from above and around like this. Yeah. So we've briefly talked about wanting to separate your farm and your food business. Yeah. Um, how do we go about doing that to make sure things are, you know, on the books, legal, on the up and up to make sure that we're not putting ourselves into a situation where we can be losing the farm and everything like that? Yeah, that's why you want a separate LLC, okay, so that you don't lose the farm. Uh, and so what we do is, you know, we, have, we actually have multiple LLCs on each farm. And uh, so we have like a, a, an event LLC. We have a food company LLC. We have a live animal production LLC and so forth. We have a garden production LLC. But when we do our Schedule F, it's all the same Schedule F, okay? But we've got everything protected with a separate LLC, and, uh, and we do our accounting separate. So each division or unit has its own accounting. So the live animal production side sells to the food company, and the food company is actually buying the live animal from the farm, and then the food company is responsible for the processing, paying for the processing, the cold storage, marketing, sales, all of that. So that's how we work it, and it works very, very well, and that allows us to know which one of our divisions is making money, not making money, how to adjust, and all that. It's far better than lumping all of your accounting together. Don't, don't lump it all together. Make sure you got, you got the accounting separate. So when you're selling it from one LLC to the next, are yep. you putting essentially market value? That's correct. Okay. So our farm on a fat steer or a hog or whatever, we're putting fair market value based on it being grass fed or pasture raised, not the auction barn value. Okay. So we sell it to our food company you know, for fair market value. Yep. Nope. Right, right. Nope. We're all good. Yep. We've done it years and years. Yep. Alan, on the uh, heritage burger you talked about, is that a 60%, 30% mix or 65, 35%? And on the organ, is it heart, uh, liver, and kidney? Yeah, so on the ancestral burger, we're doing uh, heart, liver, kidney, 
and we'll go up to about 30% on the organ meats. Okay. But the one organ you got to be careful of not to add too much is the liver. We never go above 10% on liver because okay. if you add liver, when you grind it, it gets real mushy. And if you put too much in there, the burger will not hold together uh, at all. It'll just do that. So, so we're very careful about not too much liver in that. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter in the pet food. Okay. So we can add more liver as a percent on the pet food deal, the pet food grind. But on this grind, it'll be no more than 10% liver and then the balance kidney and heart. Uh, so we'll go up, we'll go anywhere from 25 to 30 percent, and then the rest regular trim. Uh, and then we also do a paleo burger, which is high fat, so that'll be a 65-35. 65 lean, 35 fat for the paleo burger. All right, any more questions? All right, Dr. Williams, thank you very much. Yeah.